the Triathlon Show 240. Up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host, Michael, and on today's episode, we bring 2019 to a close by listening to selected segments from some of my and many of you listeners' absolute favorite interviews of the year. I have chosen 10 episodes that I think were the most impactful, useful, and relevant, and I have then selected a segment from each of these interviews use of anything from just uh, a few minutes in time to close to 10 minutes for some of them. And I will play each of these uh, segments back here for you so uh, that you can re-listen to it if you've already heard it in the original episode or perhaps you're a newer listener, then uh, this might be the first time you hear anything from that guest or that interview and perhaps that will inspire you to go and listen to the full episode, which will be very easy. I will have links to all of the original episodes in the episode description and the show notes that you can find on scientifictriathlon.com forward slash TTS214. But before we listen to the segments, as usual, big thanks to our sponsors, Precision Hydration, that you can find on precisionhydration.com. And uh, I've mentioned in uh, past episodes that there is a new and updated uh, article on the Precision Hydration website based on a new study that is called Electrolyte Beverage Consumption Alters Electrically Induced Cramping Threshold. And in this article on precision hydration that reviews this uh, research paper, research publication, we find that uh, although electrolytes is uh, by no means the one magic cure for cramps, because there are many possible reasons for cramps and uh, a multitude of factors that contribute to them, it does show, again, as uh, previous re research has done, that electrolytes uh, tend to be one of those factors that a lot of people that suffer from cramps can benefit from taking. And uh, in this study, they show just that, that, uh, the, uh, that consuming electrolyte beverages, they increased the uh, cramping threshold of the subjects in the study. So check out Precision Hydration's write-up on their blog if you're interested to learn more. And then, of course, you'll find the link to the original research paper as well. And if you're interested in trying your first box or tube of electrolytes for free, use the promo code DATTRAFLONSHOW, all one word, all caps, on precisionhydration.com. And thank you to Roka that you can find on roka.com. One of the items in the Roka product line that I haven't mentioned that much is uh, the fact that they have prescription glasses as well as their performance sunglasses as well as uh, casual stylish sunglasses. But uh, Roka carries prescription sunglasses. This is uh, US only, but they have multiple options, uh, customization options, etc. home try-on options. So definitely something that uh, you should check out if you're wearing glasses and you're looking to get a new pair because like everything Roka does, this, uh, uh, these glasses are of super high quality and uh, a massive amount of attention has been put into getting every single detail of them right. Check them out or if you're not a user of prescription glasses, then as usual you can check out wetsuits, tri suits, swim skins and high performance eyewear. And, and on roca.com and you can use the promo code TTS20 to get 20% off your entire order. So let's get into the first audio segment and this one is from episode 172, World Champions Keep Things Simple, a training masterclass with Joel Filial. And I would say that this is my absolute favorite episode of all time on the podcast which made it really difficult for me to select just one segment of it. But suffice it to say, if you have not listened to this episode in full, you have to do that after you listen to this episode. And in this particular segment that I'll play for you, Joel talks about his thoughts on workload and managing that in triathlon. It's a good segue from where we just were, you know. Um, I think in endurance sport, um, I think because probably because of the ability to measure things um, outside of the lab. Um, and, and, you know, we essentially have mobile ergometers on our bikes and, and we've got, you know, data from every run that we do now. It, it's Things have trended towards, I think, more focus on intensity. And you could probably say this even across sports. And, and as, as we've understood, 
you know the the impact of intensity and the the you know even even more in triathlon the the specificity of intensity uh, there's been been this focus on on that you know focus on sort of key workouts you know quote unquote key workouts what are what are your key workouts and trying to understand even the whole concept of key workouts you might say is a misnomer there there's no such thing as really a key workout that is unlocks the the program or unlocks success um but in fact it's you know my my view and my experience it's that that workload over time or that chronic training load over time is is uh, a big driver of of uh, ult- ultimately your success and achieving your potential and you know underpinning that it, it's the it's the volume and frequency that that is the biggest impact you know um, i'll take an athlete who primarily trains you know easy but with relatively high volume and frequency uh, over you know a, a reverse to that of fairly high intensity but lower volume um i think we can't escape um uh, I, I guess a critical volume if you like um over time as a as a driver of a aerobic endurance sport um yes we know that it's the impacts of you know high intensity training and race pace training but we also how i see it is you can only do so much of that and if you're if it's not underpinned by by f- frequent easy training frequent frequent low intensity training over time then you know that i guess i think of it as like a foundation underneath i mean maybe a quite traditional aerobic base way of thinking about it but you know i think actually that's the fundamental thing that we're trying to do and um you know it's we we you started by asking what you know, major mistakes and is keep uh, re- relating to keeping things simple and and i think the major error um that we're all we all tend towards because of the the you know, variety of factors which you might talk about including ego it is just about intensity and then do, overdoing intensity and overdoing uh, race pace sessions and overdoing race specificity uh, it's tempting to to think about the most direct route you know to um to getting where we want to go or at least it it intuitively may think, seem like that uh in the most specific way if you want to get better at you know, running uh, whatever pace for your 10K, then you should practice running that pace more often. But actually, that's perhaps not the best way. And and certainly, you know, what, what I've come to understand is is the higher intensities have, you know, there's a tolerance to how much you can do. And, and you might even say a toxicity to, to too much, you know, too much makes you ill or, or makes you, you know, has, has a negative impact. And so, you know, I think even when we're thinking self-coached or even recreational, like age group or serious age group, um, you know, compared to elite, you know, there, there's still a maximum tolerance. You know, the elites don't necessarily do massively more intensity uh, or volume of, of race specific intensity or, or faster than race pace. Um, they don't necessarily do any more. You know, there's a certain amount you can do and recover from. And it's the rest of the training that's then kind of interesting is how much volume can you consistently do while you're doing uh, race race intensity or higher intensity and how much of that do you do? But, you know, I always come back to, you know, frequency, consistent volume over time. And um, that just means to me, um, you know, for, first bu- building up, you know, how many times you're training per week in each sport mostly easy um build the total volume mostly easy start to add um uh, work like hills and 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 lower intensity uh lower than race pace i, I think you can do a lot with un- under race pace or under uh threshold which ha- however you think about various thresholds you can do a lot with going under you don't need to do a lot uh over but uh, it's so tempting to want to do those um, high intensity sessions, but maybe to, to demonstrate to yourself that you're getting fitter, or to prove to yourself, or test yourself. But uh, of course, the the irony there is, if you do too much testing, you inevitably compromise your chronic training load. So you're actually compromising that consistency. The next segment is from episode 175, which is from Dan Lodang, the coach of Jan Frodeno and Anne Haug, both Ironman world champions in 2019. 
and uh, also uh, the head of innovation and coaching at the Borda Hansgrohe Pro Cycling Team. So if you are the coach of both the male and female winner of the Ironman World Championships, then obviously you make any top list. And uh, this uh, top interview, so it was a 19 list, is uh, no exception. I would add that I'm also very fortunate to have got to meet uh, Dan in person at a two-day seminar in Lisbon. And that seminar and uh, getting to meet him in person really showed what a great person he is, in addition to being an extremely good and knowledgeable coach so uh, i'm very thankful for him taking the time to educate all of us coaches there in in lisbon but this segment that i'll play for you is uh, a discussion on the typical periodization structure leading into an ironman starting from very far out half a year out or so from something like your key ironman race of the year In general, I, I have a structure. Um, I, I start with oh, 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 the, the priorities first. At the beginning of the se- season, the priority is higher on technique. So it doesn't matter if it's um, now uh, swimming, running, or, or on the bike. So technique, then we are working on, on, on speed, strength, and then economization. So that's some kind of um, the, big, the big bricks in, uh, in that wall uh, for the build-up. And um, you could also, uh, from when we look from the metabolic side, it's also so. So during the technique phase, you just come back to training. So you just get you, uh, your body um, used to training. So to get back to regular training, to to build up the stu- the, the muscular structure to make them ready. Uh, and then um, generally, we are working on on the maximum um, oxygen uptake. So some VO two max training, uh, and this is. When I, uh, that's why I mentioned on one hand, uh, one hand speed, on the other hand, VO2 max. So the one thing is the metabolic, what is going to happen from the metabolic side. And the other thing is what's really happening on the field. So uh, if we're working on VO2 max intervals and run, for example, or we do them uh, as hill reps, or we do them in the flat, if you do some 200 meters uh, intervals, for example, um, it's also some, some kind of speed work. So you're working on the speed. And um, then comes the um, a long period where, where where strength and strength endurance where they take a, a big part of, of of the training, and then eight weeks before eight to twelve weeks before the the main competition, um, you should use what you build up before to and and make it economically. So try to teach your body to get the best out of it, but in a really economical way. When we talk about um, uh, Ironman training, and that is uh, in some simple words how 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 I'm doing the build up with nearly all of my uh, long distance athletes. For sure, you have some differences in, from um, some athletes who are already more or who have more strength from nature, or who have more more speed from nature, or who who have more prob- problems to make um, to um, to work economically. So perhaps there you. You shift a little bit, so you you give more importance to one of these uh, of these phases. But in general, that that is some kind of a build up, and it's not that I do it from day one to race day, but we repeat this kind of cycles um, several times in the preparation to the to the Ironman. And for this, we're using, for example, some half Ironman races in the preparation. For example, two half Ironman with two seventy point three races up to the Ironman, and to these seventy point three races, we do this cycle every time. So we continue. We start with technique, speed, strength, economization, and then at some point comes the race, recovery, and then we start again with this cycle. And then comes the race, and then we start again. So there are in general two to three cycles until the main race that are built up on a quite similar way. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, with, with the economization phase, uh, I think that that uh, you that assumes I assume that that refers to like you do quite a lot of race pace uh, specific training in in that phase. Is that correct? Yeah, that's um, a lo- uh, some some ra- um, yeah some race pace training, but also uh, below race pace. So this yeah what you could call perhaps sweet spot training and on the on the bike um, or on the run. It doesn't matter. Um, also to, to train the, the fat oxidation. So this, uh, yeah, long runs, long, 
long rides where you um, teach your body to use the energy from the from the fat acids um this is also some kind of um yeah, economization so that the body gets used to this and for sure we are uh, for long distance uh, triathlon there we are also using this kind of race pace efforts because it's good to teach the muscles to work for a longer time in that intensity zone and on the other side it's not so stressful it's not like if we're talking about olympic distance triathlon where for sure if you go uh, a lot of time in race pace you will just be exhausting in the training so that's it's a, it's a different approach um but when we're talking about long distance training there the metabolic impact of race pace is less higher than uh, uh, when we're talking about the high intensities that we have on on shorter distances the next segment is from episode 169 which is called ftp vo2 max and vla max what triathletes need to know and it's with uh, sebastian weber who is the founder of uh, inside this episode was one that i think might have made the largest impact in terms of training and physiology knowledge for listeners uh, because this episode really explained why we should never get dogmatic about different training ideologies for example the classic polarized versus sweet spot debate that uh, has been raging for years because the reality is that depending on our individual physiology either one of them may or may not be ideal so this little class in physiology will be a great reminder of how your physiology can and should have a big impact on training decisions if you really want to optimize your training so enjoy this uh, segment with uh, sebastian weber from inside I mean, FTP is kind of, you know, the modern um, power training term for anaerobic threshold, right? I mean, that's where it comes from, functional threshold power. Um, I mean, basically what it is, it's this kind of old but still valid and important concept of there is an anaerobic threshold. There is an intensity. This is a very good uh, documentator. There's an intensity, uh, a maximum intensity at which so to speak, your lactate level stabilizes. it. That's why it's also called the maximum lactate steady state. So it's an intensity where you can go, uh, you can keep going, uh, to maximum intensity which you can hold without accumulation of, fat, of lactate and all the fatigue that goes along with that phenomenon. Um, so it's related, it's not the same, but it's related to your whatever 10k running speed to your one hour time trial performance. And statistically, it's even related to like your marathon running speed or half marathon running speed. And most people know about this. I mean, everybody might have heard here about FTP and so on and so forth. Yet the least amount of people ask the question, okay, why does it even exist? Like if my FTP is 300 watts, why is it at 300 watts? And why is the FTP of Tony Martin at like 450 watts? Like, and I'm not asking this question in terms of, oh yeah, because he's professional or because he is world champion. No, 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 that's the other way around. He is world champion or has been world champion because his FTP is that high. So the question is, physiologically, what determines this threshold? And the, the truth is that your VO2 max and your VLA max determine approximately 97.5%. So almost all the power output F at FTP is determined by these two systems. And basically why this is, is because your aerobic system basically defines how much lactate you can combust. Because this is how you combust lactate. Everybody knows that. You do an interval training between the intervals. You do easy pedaling, easy running to combust lactate. So the aerobic system determines how much lactate you can combust. And your glycolytic system, your VLA max, well, I mean, that's lactate production, right? So this determines how much lactate you produce. So these two combined, VO2 max and VLA max, determine what is your FDP, what is your threshold power. Um and therefore, if you want to train FTP, if you want to increase your FTP, you are better off understanding what is your VO2 max or VLM max, because then simplified, you can start to understand which knob, so to speak, you have to turn. Because... Can you give an example or, or a couple of examples there with what, how 
like if if we have two riders with uh, with the same FTP, for example, I know you did in a YouTube presentation that we can link to in the show notes. You had had a great example of two riders with the same FTP but very different metabolic profiles. And, yeah, uh, I mean, I mean, yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, um, you can you know you can view that as basically your FTP, so to speak, is 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 like. That's like how much money you have in your bank account, right? And then you can come to a certain amount of your bank account by having either earning more and spending more or earning less and spending less, so to speak, right? So it's always these balance of these two systems. And and it's funny. It's it's a it's a it's a funny special thing in endurance sport that people train for FTP and even pay people to help them work on this number work on their power output without these people trying to help them understand the mechanics behind it what i'm trying to say is that i can go to a physiotherapist or i can go to a doctor and ask for a prescription i get a i get a rehabilitation program from my physiotherapist or i get some kind of medication from my doctor and i'm awaiting that they un- understand the mechanism why are they are prescribing this kind of therapy and the phenomenon we have in endurance sports a lot is that people are prescribing training programs without really knowing the mechanics on how this training program will work. It's more like, oh, yeah, this has worked with 15 other athletes in the last three years, and therefore I think it should work with you. If this happens to me at a doctor or at a physiotherapist, I would not be happy, and hopefully you would, we would also not be happy with that kind of answer. We say, yeah, but what is the mechanism? Why do I have to do this exercise? What is the mechanism? How and why does it help me to cure whatever my knee pain or my back pain or whatever my problem is? Or on a biochemistry level, why should I take this kind of medication? What does it do to my body to solve this issue? And this is, sorry for... <laughs> Sorry for the long answer. And this is basically the same uh, when it comes to FTP and VO2 max and VLA max. If you have a high VO2 max, it will lift up your FTP power. And if you have a high VLA max, it will decrease your FTP power. Okay. So, for example, you can have a 300 watts FTP for, let's say, two 75 kilogram athletes. You can have an FTP of 300 watts with one athlete having a VO2 max of 65 and a VLA max of uh, 0.3, for example, or 0.4. And another athlete might have the same FTP with whatever a VO2 max of 76, so close to a professional, but then maybe a VLA max of 0.7. And if you don't know that, if you don't know what is what is behind this, how my FTP is created, what is the mechanism behind that? Well, how can you really come up with with a very precise and focused training program? Because with one athlete, you would maybe want to decrease the VLA max because F, the VO2 max is already super high, and with the other athlete, you already have a low VLA max, and you maybe want to increase the VO2 max, right? So two different, completely different uh, training programs you would prescribe for those kind of athletes the next segment is from episode 181 which is called endurance sports nutrition state of the art in 2019 with professor john hawley and this i would say has become the go-to nutrition episode for sure that i steer everybody to when it comes to nutrition questions because john is uh, one of the absolute heavy hitters in the academic field of endurance sports and nutrition And uh, this particular segment that I selected goes into a few different things, actually, including both uh, nutrition periodization, some misconceptions about it, and also how top endurance athletes really eat in practice. For the endurance athlete, you know, there won't be a massive variation from, you know, competitive season to to non-competitive. Maybe the carbohydrate intake is is increased as the competition gets nearer and the workouts get more intense and they're more carbohydrate dependent. But on the whole, the the athlete's diet is quite stable across the year. But what I'm saying here is across a week or across different training sessions, there may be, you know, deliberate attempts to withhold carbohydrate. There may be deliberate attempts, as we said before, to go in the fasted state and to do a, a long ride, four, five, six hours or whatever it happens to be to enhance fat oxidation. These are all subtle things, but I'm saying over the general course of the year, you know, you're not suddenly go to 
to eat 80 percent of your energy from carbohydrate in the competitive season and you know down to 20 percent in the non-competitive that just doesn't work on average you know i don't like using percentages because that's a, a relative term and not an absolute but generally athletes will will consume you know 70 odd percent of their energy intake from carbohydrates throughout the year it may drop to 55 on some occasions it may go as high as 80 in others it's pretty stable but on a day-to-day basis with different training sessions and different objectives of those training sessions, the nutrition subtleties will change. Mm, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. But I think we need to add this term then to the commonly misunderstood because I certainly read articles on uh, various sites where uh, the authors refer to nutrition periodization as, for example, uh, in the preseason having a block of lower carbohydrate training where it's not really so much about the day-to-day but actually for three weeks they uh, reduce carbohydrate significantly and and then increase it later on but what you're saying is that that's not really what it's about which may- makes sense i'm not at all disputing that but but I, I guess that what i'm saying is that it's often misunderstood and uh, in, yeah. in in its use in that case well look again if you look at the data and look at the habitual dietary intakes of athletes and that's out there again my wife's reviewed the literature. It's remarkably stable. Just think of yourself as, a, as an athlete. You know, when you're not training 20 hours a week and you've perhaps got, you know, that off-season, three or four weeks, whatever it happens to be, where you're just doing three sessions a week or whatever, you're probably not changing the composition of your diet that much in terms of percentages. You're probably just lowering the energy intake. So, again, I would argue quite strongly that the, the athlete eats pretty similarly throughout the year. But uh, in those small micro cycles, whether it's pre-competition or pre-season or whatever it happens to be, yes, there will be subtle subtle changes, but they're not massive sledgehammer changes, not to the extent that I think people imagine. Well, speaking of that, those habitual eating patterns, you have a paper called Swifter, Higher, Stronger, What's on the Menu? And uh, in that paper, you, uh, as far as I understand it, uh, I only read the abstract, but you investigate what elite endurance athletes uh, typically eat and and how it differs yeah. culturally but but also what are the commonalities so can you talk a little bit about your findings in that paper sure yeah well i guess the first thing to to note and this was a real breakthrough is that that article that was an invited review which was published in science which is probably you know one of the highest impact journals in the world so for science to include something on sports nutrition and actually include it on the cover of the journal was a massive breakthrough so Uh, you know, all credit to my wife, because she did most of the heavy lifting and the writing on this. But that was really, uh, I think, quite a feather in the cap for sports nutrition, the fact that at last, serious nutritionists and scientists were taking sports nutrition properly. So I just wanted to preface it with that. So in the article, yeah, we discuss uh, some of the practices of, of, of elite athletes. And you know, you sent me a couple of questions of whether these apply to the recreational athlete or the amateur athlete who's very, very good. I I think they do. I think it's just in absolute terms that they differ. You know, you can have someone training eight hours a week. You can have, in your case, 20 hours a week. You know, you can have, dare I say it, 28 to 30 hours a week for some of the Hawaii Ironmen and such like. I don't think the overall, you know, energy for doing the activities the composition changes it's just that if you're burning more calories you're eating more as far as you know as i said to you before the more training you're doing the more likely you have to be relying on some of the you know sports products that we very quickly discussed the bars the gels the carbohydrate electrolyte fluid replacement drinks and all these sort of things so again depends on the population you're talking about but in that article we make the point that uh, i guess it's it's degrees of magnitude for someone who's training three hours a week versus 30 hours a week, yeah, it's a tenfold increase. Something has to change, but the principles are probably pretty similar and, you know, a lot more similar than we perhaps like to think. Of course, the elite athlete is different. So um, physiologically, they're, they're massively different, but the fuels to combust their muscles, you know, whether you've got an elite muscle or a, a recreational trained muscle, you know, it still burns carbohydrate, it still burns fat, it still needs protein for resynthesis. It's just the degree which, you know, the training demands dictate the athlete in heavier training needs more. So we try to get that across in the in the article. And again, we discussed some of the things that we've talked about, um, the periodization, the ketogenic diet, some of the sports bars and gels. And again, one of the questions that you said is about the habitual intake of athletes there. If you look at the Kenyans who are a great model there, 
they're carbohydrate dependent. Their meals are very simple. They're lacking in a lot of the high saturated fats that we get in the Western diet. Uh, and again, you know, look at the Kenyans and, uh, and the East Africans. They're the best long distance runners. Are they great because of their diet? Probably not. They're great because of their tri- training. They're great because they're born at altitude. But certainly the diet plays a part and, you know, puts the icing on the cake. Yeah, and, and their body composition, they're not at a high body fat, fat percentage exactly. So so it's a good argument <laughs> against the fact that carbohydrates make you fat. And also, I don't think that they have type 2 diabetes. <laughs> Look, that you know, most of the Africans are, you know, 48 kilograms ringing wet. So, you know, a, a Westerner who's 70 kilos is never going to win a big city marathon these days. And 70 kilos, you know, as you know, isn't that heavy. But uh, you, generally for over 50 kilos now, you, you know, you're not going to be at the front of the pack. And, you know, your listeners can look at the next start line of a marathon race and, you know, the skinnier guys are at the front and the, the, the people who are heavier, I dare say, it, are going to finish at the back. It's as simple as that, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so did you analyze food diaries in that uh, paper or in the research for that, for that paper? And did you find any, like, staple meals that seem to be common if we, for example, take a from a common Western diet, but from an elite athlete's perspective, like what would be some typical meals that they might consume for breakfast and or lunch and or dinner? Well, look, for the Africans, it's completely different. You know, they they have a lot of mealy, mealy and maize and stuff, which probably looks fairly unpalatable to us. But for the general Western diet, you know, the, the staples are still the staples, the, the breads, the yogurts, the pastas, the potatoes. Uh, and it's funny, nutrition s- tends to go in waves. You know, at the moment, there's this big uh, push in some of the medical journals that, you know, eggs are bad for you and blah, blah, blah. And Stuart Phillips and others in the protein area have come out and said, well, you know, that's not necessarily true, for example. Um, there's a, There's been a swing against, you know, dairy. The, uh, things come and go. But the endearing and the enduring feature is, you know, carbohydrates are carbohydrates. And you know, for the most part, no matter how you get them in, the muscle sees them the same. They'll resynthesize them to glycogen. Uh, and again, the, on a meal to meal basis, it's very hard to give you that information because it depends where you are. If you're in Europe, you're eating differently to South America, you're eating differently to North America. But again, most of your listeners will know what the good high quality carbohydrates are. They'll know to stay away from the saturated fats. They'll know that, you know, protein in both animal form and vegetable form is, is very good. Uh, I think I think most people have got a pretty good idea of what they should be eating. It's just whether, whether they stick to that is the, is the point. The next segment is from episode 177, Polarized Training with Stephen Seiler. Dr. Seiler was a much requested guest and uh, he is the man who did most of the original research and coined the phrase polarized training. And in this episode, he described polarized training and the research behind it. He also explained some of the practicalities of uh, of training according to a polarized training philosophy, if you will. And this particular segment that I selected is uh, Dr. Seiler's thoughts on how to really use uh, the training time that is not allocated to low intensity, uh, but to moderate and or high intensity, and uh, including importantly what considerations triathletes should uh, make for that particular amount of training time if you take rowers they compete over six seven minutes so their competition is actually at basically at vo2 max or or above in terms of intensity and they are really polarized in their training they just don't do much threshold training um, cross-country skiers are also very careful in their training, they do a lot of low intensity and then they, they will apply, you know, the zone three or they, they use a five zone model. So in a five zone model, they tend to do a lot of zone four. Now, if, but if you go to, uh, you, you know, you guys are triathlon, Olympic triathlon or particularly Ironman, then, then I can see and we see some evidence that that distribution may be more uh, what we might call pyramidal, where you've got it kind of steps down from you know eighty percent at high in- at low intensity, and then maybe uh, ten and ten, or twelve and eight percent, you know, at zone two and zone three. So, so there's different ways of skinning this cat. And and one thing that's important to say is is that we've done some experimental work where we've had trained athletes come in and do different training sessions, either clearly in zone one 
clearly in zone two or clearly in zone three. And then we've measured their recovery using heart rate variability to try to see what, you know, how do they recover from a, a one hour zone one session, a, a two hour zone one session, a, a 30 minute active zone two session, you know, or with 30 minutes of threshold work or an interval session, you know, with the typical uh, kind of VO2 max intervals. And when we did that, we actually could not distinguish the recovery between zone two and zone three. That is to say that in both cases, when they did these, these harder sessions, they had, they had a delayed recovery as be- measured with heart rate variability. Whereas when it was just zone one, they recovered very quickly. So, we start to get into some questions regarding, you know, zone two and three, how different are they really? Uh, or, you know, do we trigger a stress response with the zone two just as much as zone three or uh, or enough that if we're going to go ahead and do zone two, we might as well work a little harder? Uh, so, so those are where some of these questions come in. Uh, and there's, you know, we have to keep in mind that the the signal for adaptation and the stress that we impose on our our athlete or, or on the body is not just a function of intensity it's also a fu- it's intensity times duration does that make sense yes yeah, yeah 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 it does and uh, i guess one of the concepts there that, that relates to this is you've talked about how the signal the signaling often seems to be related to when you do these more high intense high intensity sessions is often related to the number of minutes that you accumulate so you also have talked about how those really hard uh, short intervals are not necessarily always always the best but i guess that's where the difference between disciplines like the rowers that do six minute races and the triathletes that do one hour to eight hour races at the elite end with the difference between the sprint and the ironman comes comes into play uh, so perhaps you can talk a little bit about about that and how you would view the different type of intense sessions that you might do based on what your goal event is. Right. Well, we've done a, a quite a bit of work. We've both, you know, looked at how the athletes actually train, how they kind of self-organize over time their own training process. And then we've done experimental studies and both kind of go in the same direction. And that is that uh, for the high intensity, you know, the hit training sessions, we tend to see very good results and kind of a sustainable level of stress by uh, being at the low end of zone three or in a five zone model, actually in what we call zone four instead of zone five or at the upper end. Meaning in practice, what that actually will mean is that our athletes tend to choose to collect more minutes at around 90% of heart rate max, 91, 2, and not go all the way up into that really, you know, the the danger zone where they may be at 95, 96% of heart rate max, blood lactate 10 plus, you know, they tend to avoid doing that very often. And and the, the adaptations seem to occur quite nicely by collecting 30, 40 minutes at 90%. And, and the recovery seems to happen a bit faster. It's easier for them to come back the next day. And that's important. Uh, I think you know, this, this, is, this is something that I've seen and, and heard when, when interviewing a lot of the greatest triathlon coaches around that, that in triathlon, whether it's, it's long distance or short distance, that doesn't really matter. Uh, they do seem to favor working the zone four in a five zone model compared to, to zone five. For, for example, uh, your your colleague over there in Norway, uh, Adil Tveiten, was uh, was mm-hmm. the guest here in in a past episode, and, and they do a lot of work right around that uh, second lactate threshold, the LT two. Right. So right. perhaps even a little bit lower than than ninety percent, might be eighty eight percent of heart rate max, or or something something like right. that. So, yeah, and 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 an eight, you, you may end up you may start at eighty eight and end up at ninety two in the course of a workout. We have to remember there's some drift that tends to happen. So, uh, yeah, so so it's in that area, upper end of zone, you know, we have to kind of agree to either talk five zone or three zone uh, in this talk. But if we're going to stick with three, then uh, then I would say 
that the athletes tend to spend time right around that transition from zone two to three, just, you know, and often just on the three side, not too far over. And then they collect minutes, you know, and, and a really tough interval session for, for these guys might actually, they may collect 60 minutes, uh, but that would be a very tough session. It wouldn't be a typical one. Uh, one of our gold medalist rowers, a guy named Olaf Tufta, that was his bread and butter session was six times 10 minutes at essentially 90%. Uh, he did that 27 times in the year leading up to a gold medal. Uh, so that was a kind of a, just a standard zone four session for him. And that's, you know, that's a lot of minutes to collect at that heart rate. Uh, I think more typically it would be around 30 to 40. And that's, that's kind of what we've prescribed pretty often is say four times eight minutes or five times eight minutes. Uh, it would be a typical example that I use a lot and that I prescribe for my own daughter who's a runner. Next, we have a segment from episode 195, which is uh, called Run Training of Kipchoge, Farah and Rudisha with Matt Fox. And uh, as a stark contrast to the polarized training concept, which is actually why I placed these episodes in this particular order, Matt Fox, uh, who is the founder of Sweat Elite and has spent a lot of time training with different elite distance running group, including the group of Eliud Kipchoge in Kenya. And um, and here he explains that uh, the typical training intensity dis- distribution isn't really polarized when we dig into it and and he explains what a typical training cycle or training week might look like for these runners and as you can see it it is very significantly different from polarized training so it just goes to show there are many ways to skin a cat and uh, here we hear about how the kenyan runners in particular skin the particular marathoning cat It sounds already to me, and from what I've read on your website and, and read uh, elsewhere about the Canova methods, for example, is that uh, the training of the elite runners uh, isn't very top-heavy on speed work. It is a lot of tempo work, as you described, long long tempo runs. Uh, so, so how would you uh, – can you elaborate a bit on the training intensity distribution and, and where it sits uh, with uh, – as it pertains to, I guess, what's, uh, what's discussed in, in this day and age in endurance sports in general? Yeah. Um, can I, it's, an, it's an interesting uh, question. Is Canova's training philosophy – polarized or not because in a way it sort of depends which way you look at it. in a way it is a bit but in a way it's not because he he does have the he does have um or he does prescribe sorry the the two to three very uh i guess hard workouts in, in a week typically and then he sort of adds in one or two progressive what he calls progressive runs which aren't a session and they're not an easy run um, these progressive runs tend to be somewhere between 10 and 25 kilometers typically maybe 15 or 20 and they'll be starting at, at an easy pace and progressing to, I guess, the last 5 to 10K at close to anaerobic threshold or ana- at anaerobic threshold. And these sessions are definitely not what you would call, or these runs are not what you would call easy. But then in the training program, there are a lot of very easy 40 to 60-minute runs. So um, take the progressive runs out, it looks quite polarized. Take, add them in, it sort of looks a little bit sort of yes and sort of no. Um, but then again, Canova also is quite good at living back to the point we just spoke about five minutes ago at, at, at making sure the athlete listens to their, to their body. And, and when I was in Kenya, I've been to Kenya a few times. Um, at one time I spoke uh, at length with, um, Sondre Moen, who's the Europe, he was the European marathon record holder until Mo Farah broke it. Uh, the Norwegian, he ran uh, 205, uh, 40 something from memory. And he mentioned that he's trained by Canova. Um, and he mentioned that uh, Canova would ha- always have a rough um, plan ahead of them, but he would always be very willing to adjust it depending on how Sunday was feeling. So if he woke up, if Sunday woke up one day and did an easy shakeout run in the morning of 30 or 40 minutes um, at 6 a.m. and they had another session planned for sort of 2 or 3 p.m. and, and Sunday just didn't feel right, they would they would do another, they would do a, like a sort of a, a, an easy to progress it an easy to moderate run in the afternoon and, and, and push the other session forward. So Canova is quite good at not at, at adjusting the plan based on how athletes feel. And um, that's very, that's very important in my opinion, across the board of all uh, training for any endurance event. Um, but yeah, back to the point of, is it polarized or not? Um, it will sort of, and sort of, 
sort of not. Um, it, I don't think it, it, it really is, but at the same time, he almost can adjust to be a little bit more polarised based on how the athlete's feeling, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah um, it, because if the athlete uh, is tired, he will make them rest a little bit more. Yeah, I guess it's not a plan that you would uh, like be, expect to get good results from if you follow it strictly as is without acknowledging what you're feeling and uh, whether you have any needles, yeah. as we discussed already. But uh, but if you adjust it, if you if if you are communicating with your coach and and you are uh, honest with yourself as well, then uh, then it can work. And and it doesn't sound that it's polarized uh, for sure, not. But again, it comes down to what we talked about previously. There are. In some cases, many many ways to to skin a cat, and uh, well, this is on the elite, and it seems the best way to to skin the marathon or, or distance running cat in general. Yeah, yeah, and and as I sort of said about ten minutes ago, these athletes can possibly handle, or they definitely can. Ha- you know, they, they've been training um, so much for so long that they they're able to handle uh, th- two to three very hard workouts in a week, and two to three moderate to um, hard progressive runs in a week and the rest easy. Whereas if you try to, prescri- if you try to give that to someone that started running two or three years ago, you know, that's a recipe for, for a stress fracture or tendonitis very quickly. So, um, you know, and we did try and point out on, in our articles from time to time, maybe not arguably not enough, you know, don't, don't, don't necessarily think this is the best way for everyone. This is just what the elites are doing. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I think Canova does point that out quite a bit in his, uh, he, he tends to blog quite a bit on let's run. Yeah. And um, he does point that I've I've read uh, I've read him say that a few times when he's like this is what these guys do but remember <laughs> these Kenyans are 26 and they've been running over a hundred they've, they've been running a hundred kilometers a week or, or close to it from the age of 15 to 20 and then 140 to 180 kilometers a week after that so they've just got they're so strong that they're able to handle this sort of training now so that's important to to consider as well. Yeah, yeah. And how much do they actually run uh, significantly faster than the marathon pace, if we're talking about marathoners, for example? Or do, oh, let's just talk about the anaerobic threshold. Do they do a lot of speed work above anaerobic threshold, or is it mostly capped around that anaerobic threshold sort of level? Uh, Canova's um, philosophy seems to, to normally include at least one session per week of intervals that are faster than the anaerobic threshold. So it's it's from what he calls about 110 uh, I think about 108 to 115% from memory uh, of marathon pace. And, and of course it's difficult to work out. Um, but it's, it's, it's normally, a, a, I guess, close to 5 or 10 K pace. Um, and so that is slightly above anaerobic threshold. And, and those intervals may be uh, 400 meter repeats, one uh, K repeats or 600s. Um, the volume of that specific interval session. So it tends to be on the track. It tends to be around once a week, maybe, or, or sometimes two times in a three week period. Um, the, the, the total volume tends to be between about eight and 12 kilometers uh, worth of intervals. That is, and that can be, uh, I've seen a lot of different examples of his sessions. There doesn't seem to be a, a staple two or three. Um, but, but I have seen, uh, for example, 25 times 400. Uh, I've seen 10 times one K I've seen sort of different um, distances in the session. So I've seen some sets of one Ks and then some sets of 400s in the same, in the same session that is. So maybe something like five by one K and, 10 by 400 um but it tends to it, it always the, the pattern i see there is that it tends to be at about 5 to 10k pace um around 8 to 12 kilometers worth of uh, total volume the recovery always tends to be uh, around 200 meters jog so about one and a half to two minutes and and, and, I, and I i have read often that it, that's not specifically timed sometimes it is but it's, it's often not um, the, the recovery that is. So yeah, to answer your question, that that is something above anaerobic threshold pace, and I, and I don't see it in Canova's methods uh, much more than once a week. The next segment is uh, the most recent episode of the year. Uh, it's injury prevention and rehabilitation with James Devonham, and uh, I have to actually really congratulate James for his exceptionally clear and structured explanations of uh, some very complex topics i think he did an absolutely gold standard job of of that how he expressed all all of his answers and uh, i didn't really even need to ask questions because he just did a perfect lecture of this on his own own almost so uh, so that was a great episode if you want to and you should learn about injury prevention and rehabilitation because injury prevention is in anybody's interest and uh, to plan your training structure even if you've never been injured uh, knowing about the 
the considerations about tissue load and response to load that we'll cover in this particular segment is uh, is really really relevant for anybody when it comes to training planning even if you as i said have never had any injury problems so the segment discusses tissue load response to load and how that plays into injury development or hopefully not developing an injury so enjoy this segment As we start to discuss this, it's probably important that we uh, we take a moment to to try and understand the the biology of, of our tissues and how they respond to loading. Uh, you know, and for, for athletes, we're talking about training there. So, if you go for a run or if you go to the gym and lift some weights, then you're providing a training stimulus to not only your cardiovascular system, but also to your musculoskeletal tissues. And what's really fascinating about these musculoskeletal tissues, and we're talking muscles, tendons, ligaments, and bone, even cartilage. What's really fascinating about these tissues is that they, they exhibit this phenomenon that is referred to as mechanotransduction. And you don't need to kind of remember that term, but what it's describing is this process by which when you expose your tissues to a loading stimulus, the cells within that tissue respond according to both the magnitude and the nature of that load um, and how you load those tissues over time will determine whether or not those tissues develop or adapt positively or negatively. So if you load them uh, in an appropriate way, they'll respond by getting stronger. If you don't give them any load, for example, if, you, if you're an astronaut and you go up into space and you remove all load from those tissues, they'll respond by getting weaker. And if you overload those tissues by repeatedly exposing them to load without giving them the opportunity to recover, then they will gradually break down. And that's how we see most injuries develop. And I think it's really important as we understand how particularly overuse injuries, which are the predominant injuries within endurance sport, that it's this mechanotransduction which which is so important. And and it hinges on this process of, of protein turnover. So all of these tissues, the predominant structural uh, property of them is, is protein. And the training stimulus is what it's about is it's stimulating events such that protein is broken down, the tissue is broken down, but there's also protein synthesis. And we're looking for a training stimulus that results in net protein synthesis. And what I mean by that is after you've done that training stimulus, the tissue ends up just a little bit stronger than that. And we can take this one step further by thinking about how different tissues have a different time frame attached to how they respond. So, for instance, if I go out for a run uh, and I load, you know, a bunch of things, but let's say my Achilles tendon, then what we know is that that mechanotransductive process takes about 72 hours, two to three days, depending on how, how, how hard you run. And what's important to realize is that um, – in that 72-hour period, at the end of that period, the tissue will be just fractionally stronger. But what we really need to understand is that there is a period of time that peaks at about 24 hours, for tendon this is, where the tissue is actually weaker than before you gave it that training stimulus. And so this is really interesting because it underpins one of our well-known training principles is that you wouldn't back up hard training sessions day after day. You wouldn't do a hard track session and then do a hard phylex session the following day because intuitively we know that this is an increased risk of injury but it has has extra we, we get extra understanding by knowing that it actually relates to how the tissue responds to load and sort of the final thing with this in terms of how the biology of the tissue is that where tendons take about 72 hours, it's different for other tissues. So, for instance, bone is even slower. It's probably about a five-day process for bone to respond positively to load. And muscle is probably the best, depending on what you do to that muscle, be it going for a run or lifting weights. You're probably looking at about two days there for that tissue to respond. So I, th I think it's important to, to have this understanding that that – 
our tissues biologically respond to load based on what we do to them. And then if we understand that, we can then look at it in two ways in terms of who's at risk of getting injury or what are the factors that will lead to you potentially getting injured. And and if you look at the literature on this, um, it kind of divides the risk factors in two. Um, One of the risk factors are, are those factors that influence um, how the tissue is loaded. And this relates to training, and I I can comment on that in a moment. And the other thing is factors that influence that tissue's ability to tolerate load, so how strong that tissue actually is. And so when it comes to the factors that influence tissue loading, what we're looking at is the things that we do in our everyday training. And I think the number one thing uh, that relates to this, particularly as it relates to running, is intensity. And so hard running, as opposed to, say, easy running, the peak loads that we see going through the tissues are just so much higher that uh, the stress that is placed on those tissues um, is, is so much significantly elevated. So intensity seems to be the biggest risk factor. And it's not that you shouldn't do intensity, not by any stretch of the imagination, but you do need to manage that intensity sensibly relative to what you're capable of. Um, the other thing that we'll... can I can I jump in here with with a follow up question yeah. on intensity? Is the the relation between the the load uh, the 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 load versus intensity is that sort of an exponential relationship or is it linear? Uh, if you know what I mean, like you, if you're running VO two max intervals, is it really a, a big difference compared to running threshold intervals? Just because the faster you go it's an exponential uh, increase in in the actual load experienced by the tissue yeah i i I actually don't know the answer to that my best guess is that it would be exponential and the but the way i conceptualize sort of this concept certainly from a from a practical perspective is is it's mediated we we understand that it's mediated by fatigue so whether you're doing threshold intervals or vo2 max intervals I think is probably less important than how many of them or how much that workload is relative to your capacity. So if you're always, if you're ever so slightly underdosed, and then you know that those principles that you, you know, always leave a rep in the tank or always leave a set in the tank, that's probably the most important factor. Because as the tissues fatigue, what we know, say, with, uh, with tendon tissue, if you, if you look microscopically at the tissue, it's kind of in a, it, it, it's, it looks a bit like a spring. And as you do those efforts, that spring kind of uncoils ever so slightly. And as you fatigue, you remove all that elasticity from the tissue. So whether it's exponential or linear, I'm not so sure. But I think I, I operationalize it with this threshold of, um, you know, of relative to fatigue, which seems to be the really important thing for me. Does that make sense? Yeah, and the practical takeaway there is uh, following the principle of, of leaving a rep or two left in the tank when you do intensity. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And the patients that I see, you often, when you when you explain these principles to them, they'll often have this light bulb moment. They'll be like, "Oh, you know what it was? I did this. You know, it's it's the you know it's the group run that gets a little bit aggressive and gets a bit competitive. And there's there's a level of intensity that uh, that maybe wasn't intended going into it, but it inadvertently happened." Okay. Yeah. Perfect. So, uh, yeah, jump, uh, please jump back into where uh, I uh, cut you off with the second aspect you were going to, to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. No worries. Um, the other, I suppose the other big factor that, uh, that is a risk factor, um, or a protective factor, depending on how you look at it is volume of training. And this is really interesting because what we know is that, um, volume is certainly volume of training is certainly a risk factor for injury. Um, so the more, but, it, but it's not an absolute value. It's, it's relative to your own capacity. So whilst excessive volume is a risk factor, what we also know is that if you have progressively built up your volume such in a, in a consistent and conservative way over a long period of time, that volume ceases to become a risk factor and actually becomes protective, which is why we see athletes that have trained consistently um, for such a long period of time 
often are the ones that are least likely to get injured. And so it's not so much the volume of the workload, but how you find yourself getting there. And so a term I find myself commonly using is is a spike in workload. So maybe you're training at whatever level is appropriate for you, but then for whatever reason, um, you up that volume significantly in the absence of changes in intensity or anything else, but a, 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 a hefty rise in volume over a short period of time, that then becomes the risk factor. Next, in episode 205, we had a training talk with uh, a world-class cyclist Amber Nieben and her coach Tim Cusick. And in this segment, uh, we discussed the concept of rather than pushing to increase power or pace in your workouts, trying to push uh, to increase the time at the same power output, so increasing time in zone. And this is a concept I think is a very, very common mistake, uh, very easy to get wrong, especially for self-coached athletes tend to want to see their power numbers go up every single week or every other week, when in fact that is often not the best way to progress training. And uh, I'll let Tim explain the concept of increasing time in zone because he did it very, very eloquently here. Amber said it. I think one of the mistakes that people make is they don't focus on time in zone. And it is, remember, TSS is a score of work you've done. It's not an indicator of anything else. Training stress score is just how much stress you're putting the body under. The actual driver of TSS is the the workout, right? The, the efforts, the energy you tend to expend or, or choose to expend. So for me, for time-constrained athletes, it's so important that during that foundation phase, you adapt an expansion of time strategy. And what I mean by that is, let's say you're choosing, you're doing tempo work, right? Well, your first tempo effort is, let's say you start with 45 minutes because you've done some good riding around. You have a little bit of base, so you can do 45 minutes of tempo. What most athletes do is then they do 45 minutes of tempo Tuesday. They do 45 minutes of tempo Thursday and maybe come back and do 45 minutes on next Tuesday. And and then they do like three or four or five workouts of 45 minutes. And then it dawns on them, well, maybe I can go a little longer. Progression for the time crunched athlete is super important. 45 minutes for one. I never try to do more than two workouts at the same time and zone. And typically I just want it to be one. And the only reason I do two is if the athlete struggled to do the first time, meaning if I, if, if somebody said, man, I almost died doing 45 minutes of tempo, I'd say, okay, repeat that one time. Then the next one's going to be 50. And if they can do that one, okay, the next one's 55. So you're always progressing time and zone. Same with sweet spot training. If you're, I see the number of people, and this was a little bit of what I saw in Amber's history, and she actually said it. She'd always be doing something like, I'm not giving an actual example, two times 20. And then instead of building time in that, that, that sub threshold sweet spot, right? She would just try to go harder. And the reality is, again, for the time crunch athlete, do two times 20 for one to two workouts and then make it two times 22, then two times 25, then, you know, progress all the way out. And there are standards. A good time crunch athlete should be able to do at least an hour of SST in a workout. And then once you, and let's say you only have an hour and 15 minutes, once you can do three times 20 with five minute rest, keep tweaking the modality of the rest. Can you do three times 20 with four minutes of rest? You don't always need more power. I wouldn't be increasing. I would not be driving the increase in power as you expand time. Just accept the expansion of time. Now, your power will go up due to the increase in fitness. It will more naturally occur. But make the driver the expansion of that time and zone, not necessarily try and hit two, three, four, five more watts. Um it will happen. And then when you kind of get to your maximum amount of time and you've done a couple of those two workouts at that kind of, hey, I've got it, I've got it down now where I'm doing an hour of sweet spot. I'm only taking three minutes rest in between, then raise power. Now, if you translate back to your point about your time crunch, you're actually everything I just said will keep you progressing training stress score for the similar type workouts. Because first you're using time in a higher zone to add a couple of TSS to each workout. Then once you get to a certain point, you're going to use intensity to add TSS to a certain workout. And that should be your progression. Next, in episode 186, called Anybody Can Be a Kona Qualifier, Genetics Is Not Your Limiter with Alan Cousins, we discuss how anybody can get significant improvements in VO2 max, which is... Uh, 
one of, if not the most important uh, predictor of endurance performance, even in races as long as Ironmans. And uh, again, as a bit of a contrast to the previous segment where, and the previous episode in particular, where we heard Tim and Amber talk about doing a lot of tempo and sweet spot training, Alan is definitely much more in the Siler camp and the polarized training camp. And you might even be able to put uh, Joel Filial on that side of the spectrum to some extent. Either way, Alan pushes for a larger training volume where a large amount of that training volume is at a lowish intensity. So uh, at or around LT1 or lower, the first lactate threshold, that is, or the aerobic threshold. And either way, in this segment, what we will hear about are his thoughts on the importance of training volume. And this particular part, I would say, 100% will be echoed by people like Siler and, and Filial. So um, yeah, we'll just have a listen. I think there's a, there's a paradigm at the moment, um, and it's probably probably largely born out of the the TSS obsession that uh, that more load equals more performance. You know, more more TSS equals equals better performance. Um, and I I think it's really important to to kind of tear that apart a little bit and uh you know and and let people know that it's it's not not the load that's going to going to lead to performance you know by if you only have x amount of hours to to train the goal shouldn't be to crank up the intensity to get more tss it's it's the right balance of different training and different energy systems that's ultimately going to lead to to the best performance um and i think that for a lot of athletes, they get they get in that that mindset of if I can't do volume, I'm going to do intensity, and uh, it's it's not an either or proposition. You know, there, there's there's the right intensities that are going to each add a certain element to your physiology, and then there's the volume that you can do w- within the context of of your greater life that's going to going to ultimately determine what level uh, you, you get to. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'll see if I can dig up a couple of uh, Q&A episodes that I've done because I've uh, I've attacked this uh, TSS obsession. I've used those exact words, I believe, a couple of times. So so I'm totally with you on on that. And uh, it's quite common to see that people think that, uh, well, a 45-minute recovery ride is not worth anything because you only get 19 TSS from it. Why would you do it? It's not going to percentage wise, wise add anything to your week but right i, I know you had uh you, you had steven siler uh on on the show um a, a few episodes back uh, i listened to that one with great interest and uh there, there was a really good study of his that spoke to this um that that looked at essentially recreational level athletes you know they were training eight hours a week or or uh, something around that around that volume and the amount of, of zone two time for the high intensity group, I think it went up to like 40% of the total volume versus the, the low intensity group only did a very small amount in, in the silo zone two. And, you know, for all of that extra effort and for all of that kind of mid range sweet spot work that, that you would, uh, you know, that the, the zone two uh, group did, there was absolutely no improvement in performance, you know. So I think that that speaks a lot to what we're talking about. That that assumption that by cranking up the intensity and taking it from easy aerobic to moderate or even almost thresholdy sort of aerobic, that we're going to get this big performance boost. And the research, and certainly my experience, doesn't doesn't back that up. Yeah, and I think you you hit the nail on the head when you said that that we're trying to hit different energy systems and we're really looking for biological adaptations and biological stimuli to uh to to then uh, get some biological adaptations so it's not the the stress itself that that's the cause it's what uh, what kind of stimulus we're imposing on what system and and that's where it becomes important that uh, we have that low intensity training and that is actually a true low intensity training and, and not something in that gray zone uh, so, Absolutely. so if we talk a little bit more about volume, because I, I think a lot of people will want some specifics. Let's take 
as an example, let's say you want to go to Kona. What do you see is quite typical for your Kona athletes in terms of, for example, yearly or monthly training hours? I think I think 800 hours is typical. If, if I had to put put a number on what what uh, a, a Kona qualifier does um, over the course of a year, I would say 800 hours of training would be a would be a, a reasonable uh, average responder kind of guess, you know. And obviously that that fluctuates. So that's 16 hours a week, and obviously that that fluctuates. You know, in the in the early season it might be 10 to 12 hours a week, and in the late season there might be some some 20 hour plus weeks. Um, but, but that, uh, you know, that, that would be the, the average responder. And certainly I've worked with athletes who are well below that, you know, who are the proverbial get to get to Kona on 10 hour a week athletes. And, you know, like lucky them, they, uh, they won the genetic lottery and, and they're able to, uh, able to do that. And then I've certainly worked with the other side of the equation as well, athletes who've had to put in more than a thousand hours in, in a year in order to uh, in order to get to that level of performance. So I think there's there is a wide wide range in uh, in training response there, but uh, but yeah, certainly ballparking it. There's there's a, a, a strong correlation between the the total hours trained and the uh, and the performance level, whether that's VO two max or whether it's your iron man time yeah i think it's uh, it's nice and uh, maybe uh, deliberate by you that you answer in yearly hours because it would be quite easy to say well 16 hours per week and uh, but then the, the problem with that is that uh, you might have athletes that go and do 16 hours for two weeks and think they're on the track to kona but then that tapers off and inc- inconsistency comes in and when at the end of the year you look at your training data you actually only did 500 hours and not the 800 hours that was required. So really it's that focus on the long-term uh, big picture that, that is required when it's, when, if you really want to, to achieve a goal like that. Exactly. Yeah. The, the 16 hours sounds very easy, doesn't it? It sounds, it sounds quite small and 800 hours sounds quite large. So it's really that, that element of consistency that's, uh, that's separating the two. And finally, Number 10 on our list is episode 176, the top five challenges for masters athletes and how to overcome them with uh, Bo Falk Hansen. This episode was uh, really great and had several key practical takeaways for masters athletes and aging athletes on how to counter the decline that does come with age unless you do something about it. And in the segment we'll listen to here, uh, Boo discusses VO2 max, and just like Alan talked about in a separate part of the interview I did with him, this segment focuses on how VO2 max for the large majority of us, including aging athletes, can be improved, and it is not all doomed to just slide and decline. We all know that VO2 max is uh, very important for your athletic performance. It sort of set the ceiling so that if you have a high view to max your ability to increase your anaerobic threshold is much higher than if you have a low view to max I mean, the, the view to max is sort of the ceiling of your aerobic capacity so it's uh, in all conditions uh, in most endurance uh, sports i mean the aim is to have a as high view to max as possible and uh, and and the the issue here is then that uh, well that will start to decline quite early, uh, maybe 25 or something. It will start to decline, um, and and uh, eventually it will get to a very low value, and, uh, and it will get into uh, to what I call the death zone. There is a, sort of a certain lower limit of uh, view to max, uh, which is uh, dangerous for you. So so, uh, and, and most athletes will not uh, experience this, but but for people who do not train. There is a sort of a limit around 20 uh, milliliters of oxygen per minute per kilo, uh, which is a, a place where you don't want to go because it is associated with an increased risk of, of death and, and all other kinds of diseases. So, uh, but for most athletes, we are we are not in the, in that zone, uh, but we still have a, a decrease in VO2 max, and. Um, and you can sort of, if you look at a, a curve where you look at the decline, it's uh, the steepness of the curve, uh, the, the, the rate of decline is then dependent on how you behave. 
Uh, and uh, if you stop exercising, I mean, there has been quite a number of longitudinal studies showing that even if you have a very, very high VO2 max at the age of 25 and you stop uh, doing hard, hard training, then you will actually eventually reach your lower limit or, or a sedentary uh, line of decline in the VO2 max. It's not like that you, uh, by some uh, divine intervention, uh, has the ability to, to keep your VO2 max at a high level, even though that you have been among the best in the world. You will decline, and you will decline more rapidly if you stop <laughs> exercising. That is quite clear from the studies from... Uh, from the booth and others who have looked into this in, in a longitudinal studies where they have examined people at various ages and then looked how they, and some of these studies were actually quite long. They were for, they looked at people for, I don't know, maybe 30 years. And, and it, it is, the, the take home for this is that the, the moment you stop doing what you, you did in the old days, then the decline would be more rapid. How, the, how, quick, the how, quick, to, how quick is the decline on, on average or as a ballpark number if you stop exercising? Yeah, was, if you stop exercising, at least the, the studies by, by Booth, they, uh, they, they looked a little bit like that uh, uh, within uh, maybe five or ten years you would be down, down to the sedentary level. Uh, and, so, uh, uh, and, and with the sedentary it, level, do you, do you refer to that uh, 20 milliliters per minute per kilogram that you refer no, to? No, not necessarily. I mean, I, I mean, if you look at a, 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 a normal individual, you will start off uh, at 25 with a maximal uptake of maybe 45. And then eventually getting to, uh, to the age of 80, you will get into the sort of danger zone of, uh, of uh, 20 or 25 millimo, uh, milliliters. Uh, and, and, and those athletes that they looked at, they, uh, they had a very high uh, maximal uptake uh, in the age of 50. They were around 60. And then if they stopped the exercise, they reached the lower line uh, within uh, yeah, 10 years or 20 years. Mm. So, uh, and, and whereas the other ones which kept on doing high-intensity exercise, they were still at 50 even though that they reached uh, uh, 70 years old. So there is a, quite an impact on how you behave. Uh, so your sort of uh, uh, lifestyle is uh, having a big impact on how steep this curve will be. I mean, the, the, the decline will be there no matter what you do. Uh, you cannot avoid it. But uh, what, what I'm saying is that, that if you do hard training, you will uh, keep your, your decline on the upper line, you can say. And, and that will, for, for as long as people have looked, be about the death zone. So you will, you will uh, still, and, and, and there's a very interesting study of a 101-year-old French guy who at the age of 101, he had an oxygen uptake of 30. And then he went on, uh, he wanted to, to make the world record in one hour uh, racing in the velodrome. So we went uh, training for two years, uh, 5,000 kilometers a year. And uh, then his uh, view to max increased 13%. So uh, even wow. at an age of 100, you can still do it. I mean, it, it depends. I mean, I, I look at it like that you have two curves. One is your upper curve and one is your lower curve. And if you train hard, you will always be at the upper curve. And at that, uh, at that point, you will not be able to increase your VO2 max because you are already at the top. But for most people, not being in the world elite, you are not at the top curve. So you will always be able to increase. And they have made... Quite a few studies on this, and, and, and that is also my experience from training uh, uh, master athletes, is that uh, many of them, which I have been in contact with, they are actually, even if they are 50, uh, they are able to increase their, their maximal oxygen uptake because they are not at their upper limit. Uh, so it is a very important take-home that almost no matter what, you will always be able to increase your VO2 max. And that is it for this episode. As usual, you can find the show notes on thattriathlonshow.com. And as I mentioned, I will link to all of the episodes that you just heard segments from in the show notes, but also, of course, in the episode description right in your podcast app. So with that, Happy New Year, everybody. And thank you so much for listening to That Triathlon Show during 2019. 
If you're fairly new to the podcast, then welcome for a full year of uh, Triathlon Podcasts in 2020. I really hope that you will enjoy the content that will be coming out over the next year. I'm excited to keep bringing it out. And if 2020 gets even close to how good 2019 was in terms of the people I managed to get on the podcast and uh, how much fun I had and how much I learned doing it and, and the great feedback that I got from, from all of you listeners, then I will be very satisfied because 2019 was a really, really great year. Of course, if you can tell a friend or two about the podcast and keep spreading it to new listeners, that is always a massive help. And also, if you haven't already, please take a moment to rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts or iTunes or wherever it's possible to rate and review podcasts. Uh, Apple Podcasts and iTunes really are the big kahuna uh, because that's where most podcast downloads happen. But uh, if you find another place to do that, please do so. Anything helps. As I'm recording this episode in mid-December, we currently sit at 594 total reviews on iTunes slash Apple Podcasts. So it looks like we just might make it to 600 reviews before 2019 ends. But that is dependent on you leaving a rating and review before midnight on the 31st of December. And uh, yes, I was talking to you. That's right, you. So thank you for doing that. If you haven't already, really, really appreciate it. I also want to send a big, big, big thanks and Happy New Year to our fantastic sponsors without whom uh, producing the podcast and spending all the time that it really takes to to bring it out and and quite a bit of money as well. Uh, It wouldn't be possible without our fantastic sponsors. So please uh, save some thoughts of gratitude for them. And if you can shop from them, then even better. Uh, thank you precision hydration that you can find on precisionhydration.com you can get a free online sweat test that uh, tells you how much uh, sodium you lose in your sweat and gives you an a good estimate for how much sodium you should replace in your races and uh, you can try your first box or tube for free with the promo code that triathlon show all one word all caps and thank you to roca that you can find on roca.com Check out their wetsuits, trisuits, swimskins, goggles, high-performance eyewear, as well as prescription glasses if you're in the US. All the eyewear and prescription glasses, or a lot of them, I should say, have uh, customizable options that go really well with uh, with, uh, bike kit or triathlon kit and stuff. So that's really nice to have that option as well. You can get 20% off your order with the promo code TTS20. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlon.